Good evening, everyone. I'd say let's give the usual one or two minutes uh, to get everyone settled. Even though we're in Switzerland, I know uh, giving the extra time is fair. It is. It's we're all we're about an international about. community, so you want to be uh, welcoming everyone, right? So let's let's be considerate. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Good morning to everyone from uh, East Coast, West Coast, or yeah. wherever you might be dialing in. Come on. Appreciate your dedication on being here. It's all about time encryption, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> At least apparently it is. Mm -hmm. Great time to stock up on the drinks and snacks because, yeah, from what I've seen, it's going to be a wild ride. So I'm certainly looking forward to it. All right. Let's uh, start then. So, welcome everyone. Thanks again for joining the first DEF CON Switzerland mini virtual conference. Um, we're definitely excited. Uh, we hope you guys are excited as well. So thanks for joining in. Um, I know you probably have been doing so many virtual events by now that you don't really need a breather, but just some housekeeping rules as usual. Um, make sure to mute yourself. Um, you can unmute yourself, but we can mute yourself as well. So please keep yourself muted. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Should you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. You can use either the Google Meets or the chat at the YouTube channel, and we will relay the question back to Ansh afterwards. There will be a recording of the talk, so if you need to drop off early, we hope not, but um, of course, there will be a chance to rewatch it as well. And the slides are available online as well. We'll post the link in a second in the chat and make it available through Twitter as well, of course. Um, so with that, of course, yes, have fun, stay nice, uh, and Yes, I'd say that's all from the housekeeping side. So no further ado, let's hand it over to Ange Albertini, um, our good friend. Uh, most of you probably know from Cork Ami, from Endless Puzzles, but I'll leave it up to himself how much he wants to reveal about himself. And the title of today's talk is Time Encryption, Friendly Today, Evil Tomorrow. So glad it's just today. And over to you, Ange. So welcome, everyone. And uh, this is also my first uh, virtual online talk, so it's a, a good, in, interesting experience for everyone. So the talk for today is called Time Encryption, but uh, the other, the longer title of it is Abusing One Time Pads with Binary Polyglots. And this talk is a work with uh, Stefan Kölbel and uh, myself and uh, uh, other people at Google. Uh, but particularly, uh, Stefan was super useful uh, um, explaining me what I needed to know uh, about uh, cryptography, and I know very little, uh, so that uh, the research could go further. And uh, yeah, uh, so you have his his bio, and then uh, that's mine. So me file format forever. That's about it. Uh, I'll oh yeah, that's my stuff. So uh, this is not about anything new cryptographic wise. Uh, this is just another use of file format tricks, but uh, some new stuff to me too. And this is specifically about things like uh, so one time pads, as mentioned before, so GCM, um, and which is tender, and let's raise awareness about how you can exploit it and how uh, you should be how careful you should be when you use it. So. Um, we actually made a much more uh, serious paper than this uh, talk and slides uh, on the topic. Uh, the currently public to uh, paper is a bit is not out all. Yeah, well, we we'll, we are we are about to update it anyway. Uh, so if you want the real serious stuff, then it's already on ePrint. And otherwise, uh, stay tuned if you want vulgarization and easier access things for people like me. So uh, how you may know the CTR mode, the counter mode from Wikipedia. And uh, again, I'm very limited in crypto and stuff. So I need, definitely needed uh, 10 hours of Stefan explaining me stuff so that I understand things correctly. Uh, basically, it used a nonce, so uh, used only once number. And it generates a key stream from the nonce and the key. And the key is exactly the, is the length of the plain text and the cipher text is just uh, the, the 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 ciphertext is just generated by XORing the plain text uh, with the key stream. Uh, 
So basically, this is a one time pad, which already gives you uh, an explanation of the title. So we're going to come gonna talk about CTR and GCM and other modes, which are all basically based on the same idea of Xoring against the keystream generated from nonce and counters things. So this is just how simple it is just to XOR against a keystream, which depends on the nonce and the key and the cipher itself, but in our case, it's always about AES, yes, but it could just work with anything else. So the, what is technically being encrypted by the block cipher is the combinations of the nonce and the counter that always increase with each block. And the block cipher is just used to generate the key stream independently, which is parallelizable. And uh, so, yeah, and CTR decryption and encryption are just the same operation. That's an important thing. So, it turns the block cipher into a stream cipher. Cipher description, decryption, the decryption of the cipher itself is never used, and the encryption is just used to, to generate a key stream. So, what if we, we, we decrypt with a different key? Well, we just get a different key stream and we just end up zoring with a different key stream. And we know these key streams in advance from, again, the nonce and the key, the keys in this case. So, what if we craft a ciphertext that gives meaningful plain text for different key streams? So called an ambiguous ciphertext. So if you just encrypt the same plain text with two different keys, you end up XORing the plain text against two different key streams. And then because it's just XOR, you can see that if you slice, if you cut your sausage at different offsets and you mix the sausage together, then you ended up uh, you, you can actually make a ciphertext that will decrypt to the part you wanted to be correct for each of the plain texts. So you can freely modify the ciphertext. Nothing prevents that. It's just XOR. And the keystream, you already know them because, again, the plain text and the ciphertext are not involved. And so if we change the ciphertext bytes, we set the plain text bytes again. So in the uh, one thing that is uh, interesting here is that so basically you just want that uh, the red part and the green part are something you control and something that is meaningful and that's basically two valid contents in the same file well that's just binary polyglots so let me introduce a tool that i wrote and is already public this is called mitra and mitra is not a parser or validator it just knows the bare minimum of each format it takes two files of as input it identifies the file format and then it tries different layouts of working polyglots based on what it knows about the format. So it definitely doesn't understand the whole file format, but it just knows the minimum to be able to make working polyglots out of it. Uh, this, the point of explaining the whole thing behind Mitra is not the goal of this talk. So there will be probably an, there will be another talk on this, but basically here you can just use Mitra kind of blindly to generate binary polyglots, and in most cases it should just work. Uh, Mitra supports uh, yeah as many formats as I thought I could add so far. So lots of combinations. Some combinations are not possible for clear reasons, like the formats that all start at offset zeros cannot be combined together. And uh, again, it's only these combinations, but actually we are talking about container formats. So for example, zip, RIF, and uh, ISO, base media, or AUG are actually formats that are used for a lot of actual formats themselves. So when you talk, when you say MP4 or JPEG2, it's actually the same container format underneath, which means you can make polyglots of them uh, if uh, just, uh, even though the format might be different uh, fr from an external perspective and different extension, but the container is the same. So yeah, Mitra is just, you give it two files, it will identify. It's very weak in terms of identification. I didn't try to, to make it robust in this case. And then it will create the kind of uh, polyglots that it thinks it will work, that it thinks will work. Uh, so if we, for example, take an example of, we just put, uh, so I, I uh, provide online uh, some minimal uh, input files if you want to do some experiments. Uh, I, um, if you do it with the JZIP, and a raw file, then uh, because raw is valid at any offset but zero, or, or, or not uh, offset, uh, not just zero, then concatenating, appending a, a raw file to a JZIP will just work. So raw, uh, Wintra knows that and will just concatenate that. So that's a valid JZIP raw file here. 
And uh, it, yeah, the name of uh, Mitra files are a bit awkward. I have a slide for that. But basically, it keeps some extra information with the file data, which is useful for the next steps. And that's just the a working JZIP RAW polyglot by concatenation. Now, depending on when you start reading, if you start reading at the first offset or at offset 24, then you will do see a different files. And that's exactly what is interesting to us. So uh, now all you need, we that's actually the slicing that we thought about, that we discussed. And then there's this script called Brioche, which is just will take two different keys and will just from the name, file name, it knows where the slicing needs to be done. And it will encrypt the two key streams to um, uh, the two, the, the same plain plain polyglot plain text with two different keys and then merge the encrypted text together, the, encrypted, the, the, the cipher text together at the right of sets, which will work, will give you a ambiguous cipher text for uh, count, the counter mode. So this is the result that you get of decrypting the cipher text with two different keys. And as you see, the RAW file is intact and the JZIP is intact in the other case. And these two files will just work. So it's first thing it works with polyglot, but it's a bit better than that because uh, one format is in clear while the other is uh, being, still being encrypted. I mean, with the wrong keys. Uh, so basically one is hidden, which is nice to hide malicious payload. And it's also pretty good because for example, in the case of the RAR, you cannot tell that the data before it is at the start of the file is a JZIP that is being encrypted. So it's pretty good to prevent uh, security uh, checks like uh, uh, Adobe Readers does when you open a PDF. So it's it's a polyglot, binary, standard binary polyglot, but if already just a bit better, which is quite cool already. Uh, so the files just work. I mean, there could be some warning, but they are supposed to work at least with the most standard tools. And now let's move on to the new, uh, to uh, something more interesting, uh, the GCM mode. So basically, oh yeah, you don't. If, as you notice, you don't. You don't want an authenticated encryption. So basically, you want some authenticated, authenticated encryption like GCM, because obviously with CTR you can just change the key, and then there's no way to know if you use the right key or anything. I mean, well, that's what you don't want first. But it, it's actually not that easy. So the GCM mode looks like that it looks a bit complex and it certainly looked very complex to me initially but basically it's just a ctr mode with the authentication that is can be done in parallel and there's a pre-authentication that is done on the extra the, the a the associated data and the, this pre-auth doesn't depend on the plaintext or ciphertext so it's done before and now you can already maybe see that the same rules are applicable uh, so basically, in comparison with the CTR mode, uh, the GCM mode is just uh, it takes one extra input, the, authentic the authentication data, and gives out a tag. Uh, we'll see that later. So the tag is um, depends on the everything you, I mean, the authenticated data in plain text, the cipher text output, the key and the nonce, and it just it's just a single block. Uh, it's just a, a single uh, value, and after decryption, you recompute, and it's compared to the stored value, which means you needed to know the original key and you need to know the original uh, uh, authentication data, which was in plain text. So, for example, um, um, the clear tech, uh, the, the start of the header of a packet, uh, which is in clear, while the content of the data is encrypted so that's why it's using the cipher text and the authenticated data in clear and this tag is reused uh, recomputed after decryption and compared to the store value and if it succeeds then your decryption was authenticated in theory so uh yeah the gcm mode basically again as a recap it's a ctr but there is an extra function for authentication of cipher text and uh any modification of Authenticated data, ciphertext, the key, and the nonce will fail the authentication. So we can choose a different key. Wrong. We can we can actually make it that two decryptions with two different keys both pass verification. The thing is here, you need to know both keys. But at least if you are able to plan in advance the keys, then you 
sacrifice a block, or you correct a block, and do some computation, and you will craft a block so that the two different keys will uh, authenticate to the to the same tag. Now you can even uh, sacrifice another block, and then uh, you can even plan the tag in advance, which is even more powerful. If you needed the tag to be something no. Uh, but this is which that was a bit shocking to me because it's not seen as a risk. It was known from the beginning. So basically, oh yeah. Uh, so uh, is it possible that there is any failures in the wild with DCM? Because now you see you can see where it's coming, right? Well, it turns out that all these companies are affected. So there was first this paper uh, about uh, that, was, uh, that is basically the, the start of our research. That what was shown to me as the start of this research. Um, and uh, Facebook Messenger was vulnerable. So basically, you can so you could send a, a picture that would be different for the recipient and the abuse team. And uh, internally, it was uh, caught during the design phase. The service subscribed with Google was vulnerable. <clears throat> and also, uh, yeah, Amazon was vulnerable too. So if Amazon, Facebook, and Google were vulnerable, then maybe, yeah, maybe you want to, to know and to check yourself, especially now that I'm providing the tools to make it easier to, to exploit. So is GCN broken? Well, absolutely not. I mean, the property are just not it was it's it's a non property for cryptographers and there was not uh the you are just this is what just working as intended but it was just not seen as a security risk because yeah people just didn't explore maybe enough and didn't think it could be a risk right in itself so now the time encryption part is that uh some systems have key rotation and they, just, they all have a key ring with all the keys, and they just try the first key, uh, newest the, uh, all the keys, newest one first, until one of the decryption is authenticated. So you see it's where it's coming. If you know, if you can abuse the key generation algorithm, sadly, there's no standard of key generation algorithm. So it's now it could be that the system, uh, the system is vulnerable, and because it's not following a standard, then uh, your the implementation you have to, to, to pen test is vulnerable. Then you can craft a tag that will be valid for a key now. I mean, like right now, today. I mean, if the key rotate every day or something, and you can or if you can already tell that which what will be the key in a week, then you can already craft uh, to to uh, uh, the, you send a file that will be uploaded encrypted to the backend, and a week later there will be new keys in the key ring and the newest key will be seen and you made it so that it's, it's uh, decrypt authenticated with the tag that you crafted in advance and now this key will be used silently by design and then you you get another payload and you control both you have you control something now you control what it's going to be in some time and there's no bug it's it's a part of the it's about it's by design. It's uh, you. It, it works silently, and this is the way it works. If there is no matching, so you control the present, control the future, and it's not a bug. It's like it's 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 known as a potential risk of GCM, as is. And now, yeah, you have all the tools just to make it very easy. So again, um, just use Mitra. To generate the polyglots and in uh, GCM uh, subdirectory of Mitra, you yeah, there are, there's a script that just takes the polyglot itself and does the thing for you. And this this script itself, so the CTR was just doing the slicing, encryption, and slicing. The GCM uh, um, the GCM um, script also correct the authentication. So basically, makes uh, generates a tag so that it matches both keys. And it's we made it very easy so that you just use so it's called Morang, and you just used a polyglot out of uh, Mitra, and then that's all you need to know. It just takes some time if the value is not already computed, but that's all. And uh, yeah, that's probably easier than uh, and it's definitely easier than for uh, understanding the algorithm in the original paper. And uh, it just works. That's all. Now you can, uh, if you find such a system, then you can already you can de 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 decide the payload, and it works in a generic way. 
So you have all the script to actually verify, and I provided a lot of examples if you need to demonstrate it in advance. I mean, the, the examples are public and the examples right. are in the slides already. So it works with, for example, PDF and executable or a GIF and DCOM. So DCOM is the medical image. You don't know it, but all your all the doctors use it, and it's usually quite vulnerable. So if you see where I'm, what, where I'm leading. Uh, and of course, you can do a DCOM P file. So, um, and again, these files are available. So if you want to uh, explain to someone without the whole paper, you can just show them. Now, uh, there is, uh, so far it was strictly binary polyglots, but uh, what about if there is an uh, overlapping bytes? Well, I mean, this is something new, which was, if you know about it, uh, something you could already have with unscription when you would have a CBC with a manipulated initialization vector. It's something I presented a couple of years ago. So, so far, uh, you slice the ciphertext strictly to each payload. So each, cipher, each byte belongs to strictly one payload, but could you do something extra? And uh, can we control two output at once? So we know that we obtain the, ci the ciphertext is the same for two plain text and two key streams. So basically, uh, the value of the two key streams being Zord, we could find a nonce so that we have uh, this uh, at the start of the files, at least, uh, equivalent to the XOR of the start of the two plain text, which means you can brute force a nonce that gets the right XOR value for both keys. And now this triggers a, an extra kind of polyglot, which is again the same uh, uses inscription which is a crypto polyglot, so basically with overlapping bytes. And you can have two formats starting at offset zero, like PDF and P, JPEG and PNG and other things. Or you can even have, a, not a polyglot, but two formats can be the same with, with different content, if that's something you want. And that's something that is not possible with standard polyglots. In the case of uh, just the formats being the same with different content, it's a bit more similar to hash collision, which I presented before. But uh, you can see that it's possibilities beyond the standard polyglots, which is even more interesting. And we have to reuse the knowledge of standard polyglots. So it's even better. And it's not that, I mean, I made it uh, easy so that you have a non script, it's just as was you accept, expect. You just give it uh, either the, the headers, the both headers, and it will brute for the nonce with the keys you gave it so that it's. Uh, yeah, it would just do, does it uh, brute forcing. It's very it's just stupid brute forcing. There's no optimization, and of course, the fewer bytes you need, the faster the brute force. So you definitely want to focus on files for uh, formats that just need a very few bytes at the start of the file, and you just reuse the computer the computer nonds in Morang, and that's all. Uh, so uh, it works again with the. Uh, PDF and uh, ex executable, and uh, it's fully generic. Once again, it could be the next PDF that you download, and it could be WannaCry.exe. You don't need access to the source of the file. Just it's just works at executable at binary level without knowledge of the file. So, uh, which is why we did that with our actual paper. We'll see that later again. Uh, but basically, uh, the actual article that is available publicly can also be decrypted to a PDF viewer. So, and they both come from the same file ciphertext. I mean, we just have one file. So, uh, there is a flag for that on Mitra. It's disabled by zero by default because the polyglots don't work as is. So, I don't want people to be confused that hey, the polyglot doesn't work because you need an extra uh, cryptographic operation to restore the content. The overlapping data is stored in the file names in curly brackets. And uh, the longer uh, you you want an overlap, you, the longer it takes to brute force. That's all. That's all. Of course, it's interesting to look for methods that takes smaller uh, amount of bytes to, to brute force. And now it's really oh yeah. So again, as I mentioned, we can make two files with the same type but different contents. And uh, you just abuse uh, here a uh, not uh, so the start of the file is the same, but just just abuse a comment let a bit like a hash collision. And in, you end up with different data being parsed. So this is very easy with JPEG, uh, which because it has a very short magic, and it starts with the declaration with the length of the command, and basically you just abuse it so that you will hide uh, images with uh, uh, basically with comments of different length, and then the parser will end up on different offsets of the file. 
on the same time. So, uh, yeah, you can even, if you want, you can even have a predefined tag or the file, um, and so the file can know in advance, which uh, by sacrificing one more block, you can, um, you can fix the tag and uh, you can also correct the authentication da data in, instead of ciphertext if that's something you want. So for example, in the case of our paper, the PDF, as mentioned, the PDF article is also a PDF viewer executable, which you can obtain from the file by just uh, two statements of OpenSSL. And also uh, the, um, the tag for authentication is uh, known in advance because we sacrifice two blocks of, uh, of, the, uh, of the payload to, to correct the authentication. So this is an overview of the of the how it works. So uh, don't hesitate if you have questions. But on the on the other hand, you don't have to understand how it how it works, and it's just three scripts, uh, and they, they just do all the work for you basically. So Mitra takes the files, generates the the polyglot and the with the information in the file name. Announce or will reuse it and brute force it if needed, and Meringue will just take that and generate the, the ciphertext with the authenticated data that you want. So the tools are already available, and I or, we already provided lots of uh, examples, which are lightweight, copyright free, and everything. So you can convince people without too much hassle. I mean, if they needed to, but you can also naturally make your own without any problem. And um, that's so basically i think i hope that by now you know that authenticated encryption without key commitment is a security risk and uh, you want to avoid that for obvious reasons now uh this is pretty cool stuff because you craft a file you upload it to some backend which is encrypted and you download it later and you are transparently infected and uh, there's no bug i mean it was just authenticated decryption in the whole uh, process. Uh, so that's pretty nice. It's silent danger. It's pretty cool. And again, they had those weaknesses from the beginning. And now with the binary polyglots, uh, you can you make that easy to exploit. Uh, so we there are some solutions that we suggest in our paper and other papers. So for example, one of the suggestions is to prepend zeros at the start of the ciphertext and check the present of the decryption which is pretty easy, doesn't require complete change of everything. It can be risky with some file formats, but it's a good and easy solution. And uh, people were kept telling me that binary polyglots were useless, but uh, here it's pretty cool, I think, because uh, really uh, the, you, you, make a, you make a payload that looks normal and uh, uh, is it evolves with time with the key rotation silently, and that's yeah something that people may not expect or people will not expect. But one more thing is not just CTR and GCM. And uh, GCM SIV, which is supposed to be non-resistant, even OCB3 are exploitable too. There's just some extra constant, but the, sim the ideas are similar, and the scripts are available too. So basically. This does this don't work at byte level, but at block level, so you just need to pad to align payloads. That's pretty easy, and you just need more than one block. But even for OCB3, it's not a lot of blocks. It's not a big size, so it's definitely doable. And just for GCMSIV, the computation is proportional to the size. So yeah, it might it needs a bit more computing. But if the, the if the payloads are tiny, and you may just want a tiny payload so that you infect uh, you for faster computation, but the file is still valid, then it's pretty cool. So basically, yes, OCB3 and, SI, and uh, GCM SIV are vulnerable too, and we provide the scripts. So the scripts here are not in, in Mitra repository, but they are in the key, com, key commitment uh, repository from uh, Stefan. And they use SageMat, which is just Python with extra math stuff, so no big deal. And uh, I made some version of the script so that they directly take a Mitra Polyglot as input. So again, you just read Mitra, you just launch Mitra, and then you launch 
these versions of the, the script and you have your uh, SIV or OCV3 uh, ambiguous cipher working. No two common lines, not difficult. So the examples are available. Some examples are already available. So save some computing if you need to prove something. And um, that's it for now. I mean, uh, let me know if you have questions. We have bonus slides and for potential answers. But uh, thanks for your attention for this first online talk of mine. Now I'm all ears. That was beautiful, man. Like, yeah, my mind, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what you've just said. <laughs> um, yeah, that's insane. Thank you so much once more for taking us through that crazy content. I mean, I'm glad we're recording this because I have to watch this back a few times, I think, to kind of fully appreciate and understand what you've just given to us here. So, yeah, thank you for that, Anjay. Um, we're going to open it up now. We've still got, for sure, a bit of time uh, of Angie as well, where we can have some questions from all you guys who are joining us here live. So please don't be afraid to, um, either in the Google Meet now, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you like, as the, we are not a huge amount. But also, please feel free to use the chat or you guys on the YouTube stream as well. Please, uh, yeah, add your questions if you've got any. We'll, we'll give you guys a few minutes. I certainly have a couple myself that I can start with, if that's cool, Andre. Um, first of all, what inspired the tool names? Were you hungry when creating and coding this stuff? Or yeah, why why the, the fun food names? No, it's actually, um, well, uh, just because I'm French, I guess, and I like food. But initially, I think they had totally boring names like GCM and Decrypt and whatever. Uh, so that's why people need something I remember. And I think my son was cooking at that time, and cooking meringue, that's why. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I forgot to mention that this work wouldn't have been able uh, possible without the support of my colleagues. Uh, it's an interesting story that Daniel Bachenbacher started it, but uh, if we, you meet me in real life, you can ask me. And uh, Atul and Sophie also tried uh, their best to, to, to explain to me and also the reviewers like Philip and Tyson. So uh, definitely not something I would have been able to do alone. Just wanted to make that clear. Sweet. Nope. Thank you to all involved for this. Yeah. Crazy research. That's really, yeah, really cool to see how you guys, yeah, still more to come from the sounds of it as well. So I hope there's another opportunity to hear updates further down the line when the time comes. Um, yeah. So another question I have if, uh, whilst we're waiting for others to bring some in, I guess, uh, you mentioned a couple of real world examples where, yeah, this vulnerability was seen or potentially even exploited with both Facebook uh, and even Google internally as well. Um, are there any others that you're aware of and, or can kind of elaborate a bit more? How, you know, yeah, has is this widely known or used or is it still so really kind of nuanced that it's not really an attack vector that is known about or used? Or is it, is it something we should be concerned about in daily business essentially right now? Or is there room for it to become a problem, do you think? So, so, so that's a bit of a problem. That's a, uh, the biggest surprise to me is that all this was apparently, yeah, GCM has this vulnerability, but they never thought that it was a security risk that it could be exploited. So mm. it was a shock on both sides when they saw what they could do with file formats. And when they just tell me, yeah, it's not, a, yeah, you can uh, correct the tag and it's not like a, a pre image attack on a, sh a collision. So it, it's, it's really the fact that this two, uh, the world of binary uh, manipulation and uh, cryptography just says, Actually, you can do that easily. Holy shit. And that's exactly how it started this research because they were like, oh, you have this property in GCM. Can you actually exploit it? And like, wait, what? And I didn't know GC what GCM was a year ago. So uh, I never cared to look. So for me, it, there was no way there could be such a problem. And for cryptographers, it was like, well, this is known. This is just math. And this is not a problem because it cannot be exploited, right? So, yeah, I'm still not sure if there, we know the answer to that. But, uh, yes, it's actually interesting when you have Facebook, uh, Amazon, Google, all being vulnerable to this. Hmm. Uh, and, and cryptographs are like, yeah, it is known. And then pe people like me would be like, there's no way that can be true. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. At least being I mean, surprised. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead, Candid. We'll see. I mean, now with the tool 
making it very easy to use. Um, I assume there will be a few follow-up uh, CVEs number being generated. Um, so yeah. yeah, interesting. For you bug bounty hunters out there, you're welcome. Andre is just giving you a whole new revenue stream to go out and check and look for. So good job. <laughs> I was going to say, like, as part of my daily business, of course, you know, where you, I do a lot of pen testing and, you know, applications across all over the place and file upload functionalities is very common and very expected, right, in modern day applications. And so my mind is already just, you know, thinking of all these possible attack scenarios, right, of how could we utilize a, a file polyglot like this where it can bypass upload filters that may be present, for example, like how what do developers need to consider? Like, what is their saving grace at this point? Like you've mentioned now some recommendations in your paper, but you know, that's only going to work if obviously the designers and developers of GCM and other affected technologies, like they take this on board and do something about it, right? Like if they decide or continue that this doesn't change, um, what other options are there for people who have to use or are using this technology? What can they do to potentially protect themselves or detect against potential attacks from this sort of uh, yeah, theoretical attack vector that you've produced now? Well, that's a good question. I don't know because I'm definitely not the cryptographer and this is already so much over my head that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm definitely not going to suggest anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I cannot take the risk myself. I just know what you can do with files and uh, the rest of cryptography. Yeah, it's definitely not my stuff. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you've posed some people a tough challenge, obviously then for sure. Um, the only other final thing I would have then is have you done any sort of kind of testing or statistics of, uh, you know, including some payloads that are potentially malicious, let's say, and subjecting them to AV solutions or things where, you know, you'd expect things to detect them. Like, do you have any sort of insights like this yet at all? Or maybe this is something yeah, as a follow-up that some other people can do to see the rates of detection that current solutions are able to achieve or not right now, maybe? Uh, as far as I know, there is never a standard uh, ACAR file for uh, encryption. So basically, as soon mm -hmm. as you un upload some uh, ciphertext, people, all the tools will just say, this is not a file, this is garbage, and just ignore mm -hmm. it. So this is why there's not uh, such a thing like, uh, oh, if you are in, if this software or hardware is in test mode, then it will decrypt stuff with this. You can, so that's uh, it's very difficult to get test vectors of crypto because of that, right? I mean, test vectors to 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 first be, be behind the crypto because it will just incorrectly decrypt or stay uh, crypt, uh, encrypted, and that's all. Yeah. yeah. So you I cannot test add, basically. Uh, I would even add, right? Uh, even just a standard uh, polyglot, a lot of the security scanners will miss those as they parse it incorrectly or as in kind of taking mm -hmm. one way and not the other. So, and there have been tests on that. And now you're adding encryption into the mix. So it, yeah, there is not really any standard for it. So I would assume it will bypass it. Question is, of course, will it get executed automatically on the other hand, or are you using it for mm -hmm. command and control servers or whatever? So that's the the multiple mm -hmm. avenues that you talked about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, uh, or the one is that you just uh, you just have an executable which show which drops the PDF and mm -hmm. opens it and inspects in the background. And before it was a PDF, now it's a PDF dropper of the same PDF. You can even get the payload to actually perform the decryption to so that it doesn't grow in size too much. This yeah. is what I'm saying, like your example with the PDF file and the viewer itself all in one file. Like, I mean, that's self-execution. Like, even if you don't necessarily have execution rights on a box that you're, you're looking at, like, you don't need to if you're able to somehow, you know, enforce the application to open itself. Like, that's just, for me, it's just mind-blowing, like, how this works right now, honestly. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again. I mean, yeah. Do we have any more questions from anyone who is still with us or if not, I think we'll slowly yeah, wrap things up. I certainly need a couple more beers to calm my brain down after that now, but, uh, yeah, we'll give you guys just a couple more minutes to bring in anything you may have. Otherwise, yeah, I just want to start taking this opportunity already to say, Andre, thank you so much again for coming in and yeah, being a good friend to our community here in Defcon Switzerland, but also around the world. Like it's, yeah, yeah, we know you're a busy man and you've got always a lot of good content behind you. And yeah, we appreciate you taking the time here, especially in these hard times where we're still doing this online, but it's cool to see faces that are familiar and to chat with people after the fact with this tool. 
And of course, yeah, we look forward to being able when the time is right to physically meet up again. And I will definitely buy you a couple of drinks to forget what I've just heard right now. So that's great. <laughs> um, other than that, then, yeah, I guess we will leave it here. I don't think we have any more questions across the chat board. So, yeah, thank you once more for everyone here. And Candid, I guess I'll hand over to you to finish off. Yes, as I said, the slides are available as well. Uh, I just reposted the link. Uh, we also will make the uh, recording available online. So if you um, follow us, you will see the link. And I highly recommend following us, for example, on Twitter, DEFCON CH, where we will announce the next virtual cons as well. Um, as yeah, Tom said, we looking forward to the physical meetings again, but at the moment we do have our monthly beer on tuesday and on a discord channel so you're happy to join those as well and of course yes we'll try to bring more content to keep you happy and busy as well as there's lots of good information that you probably need to go over again to realize what Ange has uh, done here Absolutely. so with that i'd say thanks as well from ours end um, thank you for joining defcon switzerland virtual con number one and uh, enjoy the rest of the day stay safe thank you all the best, guys. Bye.